Okay, I just started recording. Sorry, I was uh, we were saying some important things about GME here, so I'm just going to rewind here for a second. We talked about GME having weakness early this week because we talked about GME exceeding the Bollinger Bands or being right near it on Friday's close and then right underneath the daily 50-period moving average, which is in blue, right? In blue here. And so we anticipated that early in the week that there was going to be some weakness. Same thing that we saw back here where we exceeded the Bollinger Band, came back in, went out, came back in, stayed inside, broke out, was outside, came back in, right? It's all this little dance of staying inside of these bands when you exceed them. Well, we exceeded them on the open of, of uh, Tuesday's candle after we came back from Labor Day. And so that was basically just free money, assuming that that was going to come back because once you exceed the bands, you're very unlikely to continue to just keep going boom, 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 and just exploding outside of it, right? It's just not something that normally happens. Like, and to be fair, like people will say, well, you did it here and you did it here. Well, okay, here's the thing though, is that you opened right here and that you actually closed lower than where you had opened that day, right? Oh, no, excuse me, sorry. You opened here and then you closed here. So you did have a good candle that was opening and closing outside of the bands, and then this very next one that was way outside of the bands, this one opened here and then closed here. And then it was just straight mean reversion right back to the center. And so while we had those two, two great uh, moves that had happened outside of the bands, it was a very unique scenario that caused that movement outside of the bands because the cat came back for the first time in three years. Right, So that kind of really excited the markets and got things kind of moving. And that's why you see these two candles. Those two candles are an outlier for 99% of the time the GME has played with the Bollinger Bands. Look at it for yourselves, right? Look at it for yourselves. With the exception of the two candles that really burst out here, there's only like three or four examples that you can find on this entire chart where it happened. And every single time it happened... GME either had a massive explosion up or a massive explosion down, right? Here's, here's example number one, right? Where you exceeded it here and then it came back down, right? And that was a 30% move down, right? That was a 30% move down, right? Then a big exceeding right here before a monumental sell-off, right? And then big nasty two right here. And both of these led to massive reversals. Massive reversal, right? Massive reversal. Okay, but I'll, I'll keep going, right? Because people don't believe this, right? And people just assume technical analysis is bullshit. Okay, here's a huge one. Huge leaving of the Bollinger Bands. Massive fucking sell-off from that point forward. Right? There's moments where it has exceeded the bands on the top side and almost every single time it's done that, it's led to massive retracements back to the downside. And you'll notice a lot of those horn structures are actually happening when it exceeds the Bollinger Bands on the high side. Isn't that interesting? Right? And the very few times that prices exceeded the Bollinger Bands on the low, you've made massive moves, right? Massive move. Massive move, right? Massive move, right? Massive move, right? But recently, we haven't really exceeded the Bollinger Bands on the low side. So that's why I like using these Bollinger Bands, and that's why they're helpful, especially if you're just trying to do some simple technical analysis in preparation for the week at hand. Because on the daily time frame, a large macro time frame, that gives us a lot of information and a lot of data, right? We exceeded the Bollinger Bands. And we didn't see a lot of buyers step in. So it was pretty clear and pretty... I had a lot of confidence at that stage to say that if we are exceeding the Bollinger Bands and you're right at the point of control of this range of price action, you literally ran right into the point of control. And so if buyers are not stepping in there, Sellers have all the liquidity they need at a point of control as price exceeds the Bollinger Bands and hits the daily 50 to push price back down to the center line of said Bollinger Band, aka a mean reversion. 
And now what's interesting about what's happening today, now obviously we still have two hours left in the day, but GME is currently printing a doji candle at the center line of the daily Bollinger Bands as they continue to remain relatively tight. So if we are hopeful for GME making a large move to the upside or a continuation of this breakout that it's begun, it really needs to start here and staying in the upper half of the Bollinger Bands. Not only that, but printing a doji, which is an indecision candle at the bottom of a potential trending move at a clear area of both support and resistance adds a layer of confluence to the idea that it could bounce here. But buyers need to step in, and unfortunately, this week, even though we have seen a little bit of an uptick in the volume from last week, this week has been nothing but lower volume, lower volume, lower volume, and that's okay, because we talked about, after exceeding these Bollinger Bands, that we just wanted to see some consolidation, and often with consolidation, you will see retracements backwards, and then you will start to print these indecision candles on weakening volume. And that's kind of exactly what we're seeing, right? And this is exactly what we actually saw back over here before we had this first initial movement, right? We had this, here, let me pull this off really quick. We had this first initial push with great volume, right? And then as we consolidated here, you saw the volume drop pretty significantly from these two, but it didn't die, right? It dropped significantly, didn't die. And then as we began to make our move, the volume just exploded. Right, And then it's kind of the same thing that you saw right here before the second move. Now, I'm really going to have to zoom in just so I get you guys the idea of the volume here. Okay, so this was the cat squeeze. This is the second one that happened after the first dilutive event. Okay, and look at what happens with the volume. Massive, massive, and then drop, drop, drop. Weak, 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 weak. Little uptick. Weak, weak, weak. Bang! Little higher than average. Higher than average. Bang! Bang! And that's why, after this move, when we talked about the consolidation, the stock remained generally healthy, holding a key area of support, right? Key area of support. And as it held that key area of support, that consolidation led to buyers then stepping in after that dilutive event and seeing a really significant move up on GME. And so what we're kind of seeing here now, obviously it's to a much, much, much smaller degree right now. But we are seeing very similar things where you make that first push with nice, healthy volume. Then you have a couple of days of consolidation on weakening volume. And then what you need to see after that consolidation is the boom, boom, boom. Right? You want to see buyers start stepping in heavily. Then you want to start seeing flow on GME really start to explode because what we're seeing so far is weak as shit. These premiums for the last, you know, let's just say three days since this week started have all been below roughly 4 million per day both on the bullish side and the bearish side they've both been below about 4 million each day last week we were hitting 20 million and 18 million 15 million 13 million like you were seeing massive premiums start to show up in GME so if we want to see GME explode after printing potentially a doji at these levels you're going to need to see that volume really start to step into this thing. Somebody's going to have to hit the accelerator and somebody's really going to have to start driving this thing higher. And obviously, you've only got three days until earnings now, right? You've got Friday, Monday, and then you've got Tuesday all day until the earnings. So if somebody wants to have an earnings push, this thing is going to have to start doing it like here and now. Otherwise, we might as well just anticipate that ain't shit going to happen until earnings. Right, that should be the expectation. And people have been asking me nonstop, "Hey, should we play? Should we play GME's earnings? Should we? Should we do ghetto spread? Should we do this, that?" And the... G let me let me say this super loud for everybody in the back. GME and AMC are the two worst stocks for earnings trades because they are the two biggest scam tickers on the world. Not because they're scam companies. But those two stocks, market makers and hedge funds, know that apes like to play these things. And they think that every earnings is going to be amazingly volatile. So what do market makers do? They collect all that theta and all that IV crush, all goes into their par pockets on people that buy out-of-the-money calls or even out-of-the-money puts on GME. 
They are some of the best at scamming people on fucking options for earnings. And while I recognize that GME had this gap down on earnings of 15%, right? This earnings was a very clear outlier. And people should be very cautious about GME's earnings because the market makers are the best at scamming people on options. And I don't like trading GME uh, for uh, like an earning play. I, I hate it. And I, and I especially hate AMC because I think AMC is 100 times worse in terms of earnings. But GME has turned into a giant fucking scam seemingly every earnings. I know this because I used to play it fairly frequently. And a lot of these earnings had a lot of movement actually. But I know that they scam the shit out of people because they're the best at moving pricing during the day. Pennies because there's very little liquidity. And when price moves pennies, you start getting that IV crush and then you start getting theta decayed on your options. And suddenly options that were worth like 80% very first thing at the option uh, at the open of the next day after earnings are now suddenly worth minus 50% three hours into the day because these guys are the best at scamming fucking options. There's only been one, I, I think there was only two times that we made money on GME's earnings. I made money on this one here because I bought a fucking call, I think a 15 strike or a 20 strike call or something on GME back at this earnings. And then it had a crazy fucking gap up and that was sick. And then the only other one that we made money on me and my multiple personalities was this gap down and rip because we were actually sitting here waiting for that to happen. And somehow we got incredibly lucky and then GME gapped down like fucking 13 or some odd percent. And we ended up buying it and then the fucking thing just rocket, rocketed from there. Other than that, like GME's earnings have historically been a giant scam for market makers to just collect theta from everybody who's playing options that thinks GME is going to the moon or GME is going to die. So I suggest being cautious. I mean, what you could consider are the idea of like call credit spreads or put credit spreads. Something where you're automatically collecting some premium and then you're selling a put or selling a call. If you have the shares to do so, something like that would be a reasonable idea. You're kind of capping the amount that you can gain. But at the same time, like you're probably going to collect a lot of that premium on some of those transactions. Again, it's obviously not financial advice. I'm simply just speaking from an educational perspective of looking at it from an options you know, for GME. And if the market makers like to collect theta and like to IV crush everybody, well, then maybe everybody just needs to become smarter than market makers and play their game. You know what I mean? So that's something that you could, you, you certainly could consider. Some people have high cost basis that make them not want to sell covered calls. But that again, like a credit spread, for example, you're, you're, you're going to sell one call and then you're going to buy another. And the buying one is the protection should it like gap up and absolutely explode, right? And the idea behind selling the covered call on GME is that you're okay giving those shares away at that particular strike price that you're selling it at. So again, I'm not telling you guys to do anything. I'm just giving you the perspective of something that the market makers are probably going to set up themselves on GME, right? So two can play that game, motherfucker. <laughs> So that's kind of what I'm thinking about for GME. I'm still very hopeful that we can find a supportive bounce at these lows with this doji. We've got a gazillion fucking indicator targets higher. 23.25, 24.12, 24.13, 25.35, and 28.69. I still have that in one mismarked, but it's because I locked it in and I'm too lazy to move it. So We're hoping that uh, that, that can get up there, right? And get uh, pushed towards that 28 to $30 level. But if nothing moves prior to earnings, at that stage, you are 100% on a gamble. You, you, we have no fucking idea what's going to happen for GME's earnings. No, like not one unearthly fucking clue. So if GME releases news and it gaps up and the shit goes crazy and we all win, then that's awesome. Right? But you cannot make bets on a pure guess. Because that's how people lose money and give their money to market makers to then further short GME into the fucking dust. So we need to be smarter than them. Right? And I'm outlining how to be smarter than them. 
So that's it. And then really uh, from a weekly perspective, like look at those weekly Bollinger Bands. Those things are getting super, super, super tight. You're right at the center line. I'd really like to see us recover the center line of the of the Bollinger Band, which is around 2230. So I'd really like to see us recover that. But the weekly Bollinger Bands are squeezing like crazy. And there's only like a few other times where we have seen this on GME where it's had a massive explosion like this. And then the Bollinger Bands have squeezed super, super tight. And the only two times that we've really kind of seen this happen was once back here, where after this big explosive move here, these Bollinger Bands begun to squeeze tight together. And once they squoze, squeeze, whatever you... <laughs> once they got tight together, right? That's when you saw a price dip below the center line and then it completely broke down. And then the only other time that I can really see on GME's chart that is somewhat comparable to this is this explosion that happened here. And with that explosion, Bollinger Bands get tight. Bollinger Bands get tight, right? I have so many drawings on the chart, I don't want to do that. But the Bollinger Bands get tight. And as they constrict, right, price dips below the center and then completely breaks down. So at this stage, that's what we definitely don't want to see GME do, right? Is break below the center in the Bollinger Bands as these things continue to get tight and then have a complete meltdown towards the bottom of the uh, lower Bollinger Band. Now, if it does go to the lower side of the Bollinger Band, right, then we're going to have to look to see where that lines up with, which I'm willing to bet is probably right around that weekly 50 period moving average at 1740, which is also going to be your daily 200 period moving average which your daily 200 period moving average is right around 1840. So that 1740 to 1850 spot is very clearly important. And what's interesting is you turn on your drawings, you've got a gap fill down there, which is around 1740. And if you look over to your left, that 1740 to 1860 zone is the very same zone that we found resistance at, at this run prior back here in December. And so turning old resistance into new support, not a bad thing. Right, So that's only if GME has the breakdown scenario. If GME's Bollinger Bands get tight like this and it stays above the center line, and then here, let me try and draw this for you, okay? So this is kind of what this is going to like. So just stay with me here because I know it's... Uh, maybe I can use a different GME chart. So this is kind of what I would like to see, okay? This is kind of what I would like to see is these bands get tight. Okay, now you have to remember on GME's actual chart for the US one, the center line, you're underneath it right now, but just bear with me, okay? I wanna see these Bollinger bands get tight. Then I wanna see the center line obviously blow out, right? Go right kind of in the center. I wanna see price hesitate or at least cling to life support at that range, right? And as price clings to life support in that range, I wanna see these Bollinger bands Flatten out like this. Now, again, it doesn't have to take as long as I've drawn it for, right? But this is just a rough idea. And then if price kind of clings to life support around there, a couple things are going to happen. First and foremost, if you touch the lower side of the band, the lower side of the band is not going to be very low on GME. So you're kind of raising the floor of GME share price, right? And that would be important. And then if you can stay and get to the upper half of the Bollinger Bands and then start to make that push out, you can get the bulging of the Bollinger Bands, right? similar to what you just did right back down here. And if price rides that up, it'll go to a new high. And then once again, what will happen is you probably hit the top side of this, right? Then you'll, your Bollinger Bands will begin to squeeze back together again. And then as they begin to squeeze back together again, once again, you're making another higher low on the floor of GME, right? Higher low, higher low, higher low. And so that's kind of what we would hope to see with regards to like GameStop's actual sh uh, share price and, and the, the chart itself. So we would like to see these bands tight. We'd like to see the Bollinger Band, the center line, GME cling to life support along it as those Bollinger Bands continue to get closer and closer to one another. Then you want to see GME trend in the upper half of that Bollinger Band as they constrict good and tight. And then you want to see GME explode and have those Bollinger Bands explode the same way that they did right here. Because then they're going to swoop back up again. And what you'll notice is this was our like this was our base, right? This was our base for GME before, right? If you look at the Bollinger Bands, right? The low was actually right where GME happened to touch. And then this lower band was kind of like the base, right? This was the base case for how low GME could go. And then it exploded. And then what's really interesting about that explosion is now the lower band 
is well above where this lower band was when we made this low back here, signaling that there might be a step up in the floor of GME printing in another higher low. And that would be important because that's something that we really haven't seen done on GME. When we had this explosion, we marked off this low here, right? And then you can see the Bollinger Band actually perfectly hit that low as GME set a new low. And then this, right? Ultimately, you broke the low of this band and set another new low floor, right? So you're setting low floor after low floor after low floor after low floor, right? It's lower, lower, lower. And you never had that upper band recover that low, right? You never had that, that excuse me, you never had that lower band really recover that floor. It always just continued to make lower highs or lower lows. But with this one now, you officially have a higher low with that Bollinger Band. And so GME is per perhaps setting up for a new floor. And that floor could now be its first higher low of the last three to and a half to four years. And that is important. That is really, really important because you'll notice that when GME, right, forget the forget the sneeze. When GME started its first initial uptrend, when this thing IPO'd and everything started going good and whatnot, right? You'll notice that every time the Bollinger Bands were setting a new floor, right? You had floor, 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 floor. And every single one of those was a higher low. And GME's price continued to set higher low, higher low, higher low, higher low, higher low, continuing its uptrend. And what we are seeing with GME today on from a weekly perspective is similar to what we saw when it IPO'd, when it started to make those higher flowers with the higher lows. And that's what we really want to see. So if GME does have a retracement, it's not the end of the world. It's just that the next phase of what's going to happen with GME is going to be very, very, very important. Because if GME breaks down on the low side, right? If GME has these Bollinger Bands tighten up and then it breaks down to the low side and makes a bottom again, all this work that has been done through here, you know, will kind of be eliminated. And obviously that would suck and nobody wants to see that obviously, right? So that's why we're, and again, like, this is not to be bearish. This is just to give you guys the scenarios, right? Because like, ultimately, if this thing puts in that higher floor, I mean, GME has a legitimate chance of matching its all-time high because that's what you would do, right? You, with your higher lows comes higher highs. And the next higher highs like are coming in at basically all-time highs on GME. At points where they had to ask, actually shut buy buttons off to stop us from buying the stock. Like, what do you think? What do you guys think is going to happen when GME gets to those levels again? You already saw the level of rabid fucking dogness, right? People had fucking rabies. They were so jacked to the tits that this thing touched sixty dollars. People were going fucking crazy. What do you think is going to happen when you start getting like back to all time highs and all time candle close highs? Dude, the, 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 the GME thing is still very alive and well. It just requires positive momentum for everybody to get like really jacked up about it again. And I understand why, because it's been three and a half years of bullshit. But with those three and a half years of bullshit have come a lot of education for a lot of different traders. And now people are kind of figuring out what's going on. And this should be exciting because you are really at the stage where it's kind of a make or break moment for GME where we're either going to put in a higher higher low and rocket launch to a higher high and having just the entire world get excited about GameStop again, or we're going to go right back down to 10 and then we're going to see if Keith and the rest of the GameStop community is interested in buying a big position there again. But irregardless, like it's an exciting time to be a GME investor. So I hope this technical analysis has helped you. It's gone on for a little bit longer than I kind of anticipated it, but that's just how most of my GME videos go. So, <laughs> all right, folks. So thank you for tuning in and uh, appreciate it.